Welcome back to the Stellium Astrology Podcast. I'm Stephanie James, your host, and today I have a really interesting guest to join me on this enhanced podcast episode of the Stellium Astrology Podcast, and we're talking about astrology and parenting. Uh, Maria Riga is my guest, and she's an attorney from the US, and she, in her spare time, works as an astrologer who specializes in astro parenting. Um, in the first half, uh, we talk about, you know, we general chit chat about astro parenting and our observations. It's almost a little bit self-indulgent because there's a lot of coverage on um, Scorpio, Capricorn and Gemini. Um, but in the second half, we get into the elements and really discuss the way that each element and delve into some of the signs as well, how they um, respond to authority in parenting um, it's a really really insightful conversation it's really fun if you have friends with children who have you know like just think about their charts if you've looked at any of your friends um, charts with children or you've got children of your own and think about the prominent elements in their chart this conversation will really uncover some interesting areas for you to explore um, and you may even have some good pointers for your friends um, at the end of it all so that you can you know um, help your friends understand their relationship with their children as well I do have Lana here who's just absolutely she was going nuts I don't know if you could hear her in the second half but she was going absolutely crazy meowing outside the front outside the door of the room that I'm in um, and she's now sort of using this room as a kind of jungle gym um, she doesn't like being picked up I'll see if I can get her right. Lana are you gonna come and say hello are you gonna come and say hello Wanna come say hi? Come on. She really doesn't like being picked up. Say hello, Lana. Say hi to everybody. Say hi. <laughs> She's too adorable. There you go, Baba. So anyway, Lana's had her her moment in the spotlight. And um I really enjoyed my conversation with Maria. We could we agreed that we could have talked for we did talk for a couple of hours and we could have talked for even longer. Um, she will be coming back on the show. Um, so yeah, second half is available to my patrons. Um, there is a link so that you can find out um, a bit more about the Patreon page and um, sign up if you're interested in signing up. Um, but the first half is available to everybody and um, I hope you really enjoy the show. Today on the Study of Astrology podcast, I have Maria Riga with me. And um, Maria reached out and um, sent me a few clips from a few podcasts that she's been on. And I was absolutely fascinated with her subject of interest. So, uh, Maria, would you mind introducing yourself and just telling us what you do, um, how you got there and um, kind of a little bit about, you know, some of the, the stuff that you're promoting at the moment? Sure. Thank you, Steph. I really appreciate you having me on. This is um, I'm very excited about this. So uh, I'm, I'm an attorney by day, a banking corporate attorney, and uh, at, by night I'm an author and an astrologer. And a lot of people think that's an odd combination, kind of is. I'm a Gemini, we do jack of all trades. <laughs> do a lot of different things, have our hands in different things. But I've been interested in astrology pretty much my entire life. And the last few years since I had my son, in especially in 2009, I've delved into astrology more seriously because I, being a Gemini, I come generally from a place of logic and detachment. Mm. So, but I noticed uh, with looking at birth, people's birth charts and transits and energies, I noticed throughout my life, these patterns that people, um, that people expressed regarding the energies in their charts. And these patterns became so consistent. I had a hard time ignoring it. I came to the conclusion that there is a lot of value in studying birth charts regarding, you know, in understanding either yourself as an adult or understand, understanding your children and relating to your children and relating to other people. So it definitely has some merit in the way I look at astrology and looking at your child's birth chart coming from a place of using astrology to help improve parenting is it is what kind of one more tool in your arsenal of self-knowledge, including meditation, self-help books, psychotherapy, hypnosis. And if it has value, it makes sense to explore it. So that's kind of how I got into it in terms of using it to parent. And it was also very helpful in reparenting, helping me to reparent myself from childhood trauma. 
And that's necessary to heal from that in order to be a better parent to your own kids. While that's a kind of an arduous process, it is necessary uh, for a more fulfilled life. So um, I always like to write. I write fiction in addition to nonfiction. So I, I've written a couple books, one on Gemini children. I'm a Gemini, one on Scorpio children. Uh, my son is a Scorpio son. I've, he's taught me a lot about the Scorpio nature just from parenting him. And um, so I've written two books and they're meant for kind of the busy parent who doesn't have time to necessarily read all these tomes on astrology, which we should, but we just don't always have the time to do that. So my, the books are about a hundred pages and they're available in print and in on Audible as well, in audio format. And they have a lot of actionable steps and examples to kind of help parents to toward a more kind of solutions focused approach. Like what can I do now? What steps can I take? What actions can I take to, to um, form a stronger, you know, better, more solid relationship with my child? And I use a lot of positive parenting techniques in talking about this. And my YouTube channel is called Positive Parenting with Astrology. So the positive parenting approach is more, it's less of a disciplinary and authoritarian approach. It does not demand abject obedience from children. It's more respectful uh, approach where you, you know, are guiding and leading the children and introducing them to everything that life has to offer. And then you kind of step back when they're older and you let them decide their own life paths. I've noticed that a lot of astrologers are really good parents in the sense that they, they parent uh, it kind of a, from a child-centered focus, they respect the intrinsic nature of the child. And that is kind of one of my big tenets in my videos and my books is the birth chart will give you kind of the, the starting point to understand your child's intrinsic nature, how they approach life, how they deal with the relationships, how they deal with their emotional life, how they learn, how they can communicate, maybe, maybe the themes that are emphasized in their life. And um, by respecting the intrinsic nature and accepting that about your child, that when the child feels accepted and loved unconditionally for who they are, that's when they bond really closely with the parents. So when you have that strong bond, the child naturally wants to collaborate and cooperate with you. So there's no need for a kind of more authoritarian, disciplinarian approach. So that's kind of the basis for the work that I do. And I talk to a lot of parents with, um, who have questions about how they can how they they can relate to their children based on the energies that they express and the energies of their child because sometimes it's very different. My son, in some ways, is very similar to me. I have a lot of planets in the eighth house, um, so so I I kind of understand and have the patience to make the effort to understand his nature. When you have a parent and a child who have vastly different energies, it does take more effort understand the child but it is necessary for that strong relationship so i'm trying to help I'm helping parents do that and i've had a lot of um feedback from parents on they really appreciate the kind of the relational approach with how yeah. the steps they can actually take to connect with their children and form this relationship because energies are expressed differently an aries child will be very different they wear their emotions on their sleeves a scorpio child a capricorn child much more withdrawn and reserved it takes more effort to figure out what's going on with them so the approach will be different yeah i mean uh, a couple of things um firstly are you going to be writing books on the other signs of the zodiac yes <clears throat> yes because i think there's going to be a lot of people listening thinking well i'm going to need to Absolutely. know um, right i've had yeah. questions already when is the book on virgo children going to be coming <laughs> as soon as i can do it <laughs> yeah but yes that's the plan yeah um and what i find interesting um is that you know you were saying about you know you've got the gemini Capricorn thing going on and you've got this Scorpio sun and these signs well um you've said already about the relationship between Capricorn and Scorpio being quite a, uh, a sort of it, it works but Gemini is quincunx kind of both of those signs so it's almost yes. like a blind spot um yes. which is interesting to me that that would be it's how you you've ended up focusing yourself like kind of exploring both you know Gemini and Scorpio in such depth because they're in such an uncomfortable relationship with each other. Yes, that you are correct. It is, um, it does take a lot of effort. So my son also has a Gemini moon, which is helpful. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because he, so he obviously, I, I can see when he's expressing more the, the energy of his moon sign versus the energy of his sun sign. Because he, 
to Gemini moon children talking is like breathing. So mm-hmm. it's a very different energy from the withdrawn mm-hmm. Scorpio nature, but he talks all the time, talk, talk about <laughs> whatever, and they verbalize and articulate the entire thought process and everything that comes out of the Gemini moon child's mouth is not necessarily their truth. Sometimes it's their testing ideas. But yes, to the point about the Scorpio Gemini nature, um, it did take me a lot of effort to relate to him because uh, the Gemini energy is very high strung and easily triggered by dramatic kind of displays of emotion. Mm. And that's par for the course with a Scorpio child. They're very Mm. emotional and they don't often understand these profound emotions they're having. That's a lot of where the angst comes from, especially when they're children and young children don't yet have the words to articulate that. But, and I did a video on this recently on my channel when, um, how to relate to your Scorpio child when you're a Gemini parent. And one of the things I brought up is that Gemini people are very good at making, at articulating concepts using precise language. So one of the ways that they can help the Scorpio child is by helping them identify the emotions that they're having, which Mm. takes effort because Gemini, we don't approach the world from a place of emotion. We approach the world from a place of logic. But if we make the effort, we can help our Scorpio children identify the emotions they're having, name them, sit with them and release them. That's a healthy way to deal with emotions, right? Yeah. Instead of being fixed water, a lot of the times they oh, yeah. dwell on all these emotions, which in, you know, in the long term is not healthy. So that's, it does take a lot of effort for the, the Gemini person to understand the Scorpio person, but there are ways that they can help each other. Yeah. That's what I want to focus on, right? Yeah, it's, um, I've got a Gemini ascendant myself. Um, so I've got the Scorpio moon and the Capricorn sun and they, and they are all around sort of 17 degrees. Um, so it's like a proper tight kind of yod basically. Um, and I can just relate to what you're saying. Um, coming from the perspective as a child with a Scorpio moon, I struggled to understand my own emotional sort of like Mm -hmm. landscape. And, um, I still do. Um, it's a mystery Mm -hmm. to me sometimes, sometimes I'm, the way I react emotionally to things is beyond the logic of my ascendant. Uh, and I've got a lot of air in my chart. I've got a, an Aquarius stellium and my Mercury is in Aquarius. So it's very logical. Um, and, uh, you know, but then I've got this very kind of passive, uh, introspective kind of sun and moon that just doesn't want to reveal things. But my ascendant will run wild with expressing myself. And, you know, I have this battle between... Sure talking too much and and then wishing I'd not revealed so much and vice versa sometimes you know so um as as uh impending parenthood approaches me um and I wonder what kind of chart my child's gonna have um it does it it does kind of um pose the question that you know how can I relate best to my child so astrology obviously one of the best tools that astrology has given me is really understanding other people and um really em- being able to empathize with people you know even people I don't like you know right. yeah yeah I can really look at their charts and just be like okay I get it they're really having a tough time right now um they're really struggling um so so yeah it's it's obviously an incredibly useful tool um it's something that um I'm so excited about the fact that you've done these books because I think that just reading about Scorpio moon is going to well about Scorpio is going to help me understand myself um, on a greater level so do you focus when you're looking at the child's chart do you focus more on the lunar placement or do you go for um like the do you, do you look at the chart in general because we do say that the past is the moon and if you've got a boy then look at mars and if you've got a girl look at venus and all of that sort of thing so what's your kind of your main sort of way to connect with the child and the chart right i definitely look at the entire chart mm. um I, I get a lot of questions from parents about very young children, like around two years old, and that's kind of harder to help them with because they 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 don't they haven't expressed their their independence. When you when the child is about seven years old and has the first Saturn squares, when they start to really mm. assert their independence and autonomy, and I think that's when a lot of this information that astrology can offer becomes especially useful to parents. But it's good that parents are thinking about it when the child is younger because they can prepare and start making the effort. To relate before that the earlier the better I mean it's never too late but the earlier the better but yes I look at the whole chart the moon is obviously very important because the moon rules your emotional life and it also rules kind of ha- can tell you can instruct you how the chart holder 
uh, handles themselves and behaves in relationships, right? I have a Capricorn moon. It is not a comfortable placement. I'm not comfortable expressing emotions. I've had to get comfortable expressing emotions and show vulnerability because that's necessary for fulfilling relationships. So uh, the moon sign can definitely help you relate to the child. Uh, and then, but the sun sign is also important to, to look at for children and the personal planets. Mercury will tell you a lot about how the child communicates and their learning style and things like that. So my son has a Mercury in uh, Scorpio and he can have a very dark sense of humor and he's only 11, but to another parent who may not have the information, they may think that's so inappropriate. And to me, I think, well, that's just kind of his major <laughs> to make yeah. jokes. Yeah. Um, so that's, I, I just let a lot of that go. I don't dwell on some of the borderline taboo jokes he may make if it's just with me, uh, because that's just kind of his nature. Scorpio, they love hidden things. They love these taboo subjects. They're very curious about things that adults don't like to talk about. That's mm. one of the things I tell parents of Scorpio children, they're going to be very curious about things like reproduction, taboo subjects. They have an ex extremely fine tuned intuition for, for everything pretty much, um, for how people are feeling, but also the subjects that, adults don't like to talk about mm. and they will be very curious about those things because they love this these hidden secrets and scorpio uh another reason that scorpio and gemini energy is not always comfortable is because scorpio likes to get to the bottom of the people that they most care about and to a person with a lot of air energy that can feel very invasive mm -hmm. right? almost like their soul is being invaded but that but if the Scorpio is trying to get to know you to that level, it's because they have deemed you an essential person in their life. And they have decided that you are worth their loyalty. And that is a huge thing. The Scorpios do not trust easily. And I tell this to parents of Scorpios all the time. Do not assume your child is going to trust you just because you're the parent. Even parents have to earn the trust of a Scorpio. That's so when true. You do, when you do, that's fantastic. <laughs> but don't assume your child's going to trust you and don't, don't express uh, anger or, you know, make them feel bad for not fully trusting you. You have to earn the trust. And to that end, I, I tell parents, do not ever lie to your Scorpio child. You can give them an age appropriate answer. You can think of something. You can tell them you don't know the answer to something. Those are all fine to say, but if they find out you lied to them, mm. that will not help with the trust. And it is very difficult to get the trust back. I think one of the other things that is really, really, I mean, I don't know about most child, most signs, but definitely for Scorpio. Um, I have a friend with a Scorpio moon um, as well. And um, she and I have both related over the fact that our parents, our mothers particularly, would mm -hmm. talk to other people about our business. Um, and, you know, when you've got a small child, it's like, oh, yes, they're doing this now and they're doing that. And it's like it's kind of like parent talk, which is fine. But when it gets to an age where you have to respect your child's privacy, mm -hmm. Um, you know, looking in the diary or, you know, sharing stuff that, you know, you have to check first what's okay to share um, because yes. even both of our parents, um, my, my friend and um, my my mum basically would reveal things that probably aren't really that big a deal to reveal. However, for me, it just felt like it was just too much information. I didn't want other people knowing this stuff and it can be anything, you know, it's so that's part of the trust thing as well it's like you know saying look Absolutely. is this is this confidential I've, I've always said to my mom always treat everything I tell you as confidential unless I express otherwise <laughs> absolutely that is a huge deal they do not like I mean a lot of children don't like it but as Scorpio children especially they do not like uh, the parents to share things about them and um that's something that I kind of innately understood because Capricorn moon placement is very similar to that. And my mm. mother would do exactly what you just described. Yeah. Share things with people. And I would say, Hey, why did you do that? Well, it's not a big deal, but it's not, the information is about me. It's not for you to decide if it's a big deal. It's for me to decide if it's a big deal. Yeah. And that goes to respecting the child's nature and respecting the child as an individual entity, not as an extension of the parents. Mm. That is something that astrology can help you help parents understand is that this child is a separate being from the parent because a lot of parents I see and they most of the time they mean well but they you know either pressure the child to be like the parents want them to be like the parent or like the parent wishes they would be right which is how the parent would be um because we all have things about us ourselves that we don't like 
and but that's not the right approach. The child is a separate entity, and and I see that a lot of the time is that they, the parents set up this dynamic where the child is seeking approval and doing things to seek the approval of the parent, not because the child wants to do it, especially for older children. And that sets up a very uh, potentially harmful dynamic when the child is an adult because that could set them up to be a people pleaser or to have poor boundaries. Yeah. And that is something that I talk about on my channel all the time. In fact, I'm doing a, a separate uh, a podcast interview with, with an American podcast here. It's precisely on the topic of why teaching abject obedience to children is so harmful to them in the long term. So, um, I mean, my, my son is allowed to say no to me as long as he's respectful. That's def he's defending his autonomy right yeah if he if he if a child cannot say no to their own parents who can they say no to yeah the parents are there to stand up for the child to fight for the child more than anybody so that's kind of my take on that and that's that's a big positive parenting approach too if you if you read up on positive parenting even techniques that have nothing to do with astrology that'll come up this idea of respecting the child's autonomy because yeah. the child starts to practice their own autonomy at home with the parents the safe space hopefully the home is a safe space so i've had questions from parents how can i get my child to stop saying no why do you want your child to say no mm. why do you that's not a healthy approach right you you can work toward a mutual beneficial conclusion but as long as they're being respectful to you, obviously, and, and if you've built a strong relationship, they will be, why, why do you have the problem with the no? Because a lot of parents, it's, it's dealing with the deep, parents are dealing with their own insecurities about that, mm, right? Yeah. It makes them feel um, like maybe they have less authority as a parent, the child says no, but that's for the parent to deal with, that they have to deal with their own insecurities. About it's that. funny, I've just literally had a conversation with somebody today about this because, um, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's having some difficulties with her mom um, and um, she's got a daughter of her own and they all happen to be Gemini's and I did actually say oh, to her wow. I, I, I said um, if you got any questions um, I'm speaking to um, this lady today and uh, sure. you know so I'll, I'll, I'll um, pose that question later but um, I, I mentioned to her that you know uh, particularly mums with daughters I think um, I read a book called My Mother Myself by um, someone called Nancy Friday and I'm talking this is years ago I read it um, really long time ago and um, and she kind of described and I'm sure this is a, a common kind of knowledge thing that mothers tend to see daughters as extensions of their own ego and um, it's very difficult when um, a child gets to an age where they start behaving and displaying qualities that the mother does not either agree with or just doesn't see in their own personality um, and it can be very difficult for the mum to accept that their their daughter is becoming an individual with their own sort of way of seeing the world and wanting to engage with it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very interesting to sort of kind of think about what that does to the parent. You know, their child is an individual. The child is going to do what they want to do and be who they are. And they're allowed to say no, as long as they've learned how to do it in a way that is not rude or disrespectful, as you said. Um, but yeah, to, to be a completely different person to who you imagined your child to be, um, can be a bit of a slap in the face to the parent. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, I agree with that. It's, um, it's probably, it's difficult for the parent to deal with. Certainly a parent who has insecurities mm. and, and has to work through. I tell parents, if you have any healing work to do, you need to do it to be the best parent you can possibly be. And if you have a Scorpio child, I'm telling you, they will force you to do the healing. It's mm. almost like, because just of the nature that we've talked about with Scorpio, how they kind of, uh, you know, try to get to the bottom of you and your soul and your deepest beliefs and how they are always looking for uh, soul oriented pursuits. Mm. Like my son said to me, he's 11. And he said to me the other day, he said, you know, of course he's on summer vacation now, but when he was in school during the year, he said, you know, my life pretty much is the same every day I get up, I go to school, I come home, I do homework, I do some gaming, we have dinner, I go to bed. And he said, I hope it's not like that when I'm an adult, like every day is the same. And I was like, wow, that is such a profound way of thinking for yeah. a year old. And I told him it doesn't have to be that way. If you don't want it to be that way, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. You don't have to have a nine to five job. But my point is, I'm, see, I'm getting off on a tangent. That the, the children will, the Scorpio children especially, will force the parent to do the healing work. Yeah. Because just of the nature of the sign. But it is always a good idea to do your own healing work in order to, you know, best parent your kids. And 
regarding the mother-daughter dynamic. So my mother is a Leo sun, Cancer moon, and with a Scorpio Mars. And I grew up a big introvert in a house full of extroverts. And I grew mm. up completely misunderstood. Yeah. Anytime I wanted to seek solace in my room, I was called selfish. I was called uh, antisocial. And I needed that alone time to recharge my energy. Yeah. Just to deal with life in school. But no one understood that. And I didn't understand it. And nobody helped me understand it. It wasn't until I was an adult till I understood okay, this is just what I need to do to be authentic to myself. Some people are like, you know, they, they thrive off other people and, and others thrive off right. alone time. I'm an alone time person. I can really right. recharge alone. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting when I also come from a family where I come from an enormous family, actually huge, both sides, mum and dad, it's massive, wow. like so many, so many people on each side. And I don't do well in big gatherings. I'm too, Same. I'm like an emotional sponge and I pick up on everything, very empathic. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's always, even as a child, like I'd always prefer to have smaller birthday parties with a handful of people rather than a great big thing. And I think that my mum and uh, my dad, it, it, I did used to get told, you, you know, you have to come to these events, you have to do this family stuff. And there was a point where I went out with a guy who, um, said you don't have to do anything if you don't want to and he never used to right. do all his family stuff and it was so liberating realizing I could say no and I didn't go and I'd and I had a great time like just doing my own thing and I'd see everybody individually and make sure I still had those connections but I didn't put myself into that environment where I felt drained just being there exactly, exactly. yeah and that's that's a huge breakthrough when you learn that I can just do what I want yeah I don't have to do things to please other people mm. I don't have to do things that other people. i i thought that i was you know, i was i remember even as a teenager i wasn't allowed to play my own birthday parties my mother decided what we were doing and i said i'd rather do this while we're doing this okay. <laughs> and i i grew up and thinking i really didn't have much of a say in anything that happened to me and that's a very harmful dynamic to set up for a kid because very i difficult. let people take advantage of me as an adult because i felt like i didn't have a say and when yeah. i realized hey, I don't have to do anything like you just said. I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. And if, and I tell, this is something I tell my son, you don't have to do anything you want to do. If you don't want to game with so-and-so, you don't have to game with so-and-so. And if you defend your boundaries, the other person gets angry, oh, well. That's, yeah. that's they're not your friend. Exactly. They're not your friend. Because that's part of it is we don't want people to get angry with us. Yeah. Right? That, that was part of it for me. But I told myself, if somebody gets angry, that's fine. If I'm, because I'm defending my boundaries, that's not my problem. That's their problem. Exactly. So that's something that's took me, to took me about. many years to understand that. Um, I think I was set up with a, a people pleasing dynamic. Um, uh, unfortunately, I say, unfortunately it's, you know, my mum is a double cancer moon rising in cancer and she's a Virgo sun. Um, and so extremely helpful, wants to always be of service to people and would sacrifice herself in order to help other people it's just yes. the way she is and when you grow up with a female role model like that you kind of feel like that's what the way you are supposed to be and I'm not saying I'm not a helpful person that doesn't want to help people sure. but it took me a long time to realize I, it took me a long time to understand what boundaries are as a Capricorn son it took a long right. time for me um right. yeah so it's it was it was very challenging and you know I, I, I studied counseling skills and I do talk about it quite frequently on this um podcast how beneficial I found it because it made me the first thing you learn when you study counseling skills is about self-awareness um, you look at yourself before you do even think about other people and see how they are triggering you and one of the things I really learned about was the fact that I was just so worried about upsetting other people mm -hmm. by asserting my own boundaries right right I had the exact same dynamic right? <laughs> I would sometimes just involve just avoid communication with people to avoid that problem which is not healthy but that's mm. the nature of air is to go around boundaries not to yeah. confront them head on yeah that's something i've had to become comfortable with just confront the thing the problem head on instead of just going around and pretending like it doesn't exist it's not helpful but capricorn energy uh capricorn people are very comfortable taking they're very dutiful responsible loyal and they're very comfortable taking on responsibility so i tell parents of capricorn kids it is very easy to parentify the Capricorn child because they are so, they love to be needed. They mm. love to be helpful. They love to be independent, do their own thing. And that also 
leads them to want to help in the family and want to take on responsibilities in the family that are beyond the appropriateness for their age sometimes. And it's, it's easy for the parent, and I'm not saying parents would necessarily do this maliciously because the Capricorn child is so comfortable taking on responsibility. The parent may think, oh, well, they want to do this. So I'm going to let them do all these things. Yeah. But you have to think about is the, is the responsibility of giving this child appropriate for their age and kids mm. should absolutely help at home. They should absolutely have responsibilities appropriate for the, for their age. Right. So yeah. that's, that's the thing, but it's easy for the Capricorn child to commit to too much responsibility and then be bogged down and burdened. And obviously as a child, you know, you don't want that. If you're a parent of the child, you don't, you don't want the kid to feel so bogged down and overburdened at such a young age. Cause again, that sets them up for this self-sacrificing dynamic later. Yeah. You want to be very careful about that. But Capricorn, yeah. it's a, it's a great energy. I'm very comfortable with my Capricorn energy. I love it because it is a energy that is, um, it is uh, Capricorn people are able to sacrifice short-term gains for longer term benefits. And in this current society of, I want everything immediately, that is a wonderful trait mm. to exhibit. So I, that's definitely something to be, uh, to be developed if you have Capricorn children yeah. or moon or sun children. Yeah, it, it reminds me, again, going back to the conversation that I had with my friend earlier, who's a Gemini stellium. Uh, she's got um, a few planets in Scorpio as well, and she also oh, wow. has a, a Capricorn uh, moon. And she was yeah. saying, oh, wow. she was talking to me about... Um, you know, um, saying oh, she doesn't really understand what's going on with her mum. She's sure her mum's going through something at the moment, um, but she just doesn't have time to help her. And I said, well, you know, she's your mum. <laughs> you don't need to parent your mum. And I, I, think, I think she feels a sense of responsibility to kind of fix her mum's problems mm-hmm. um, when actually, you know, it's not down. She's got her her life and her she has a small daughter as well so she can't parent her daughter and her mother uh you know it's that challenge with Capricorns that responsibility um you know and I think that some parents you know like some parents whether they're aware of it or not actually enjoy that that kind of dynamic where they are Mm -hmm. you know some parents I've I've got a lot of friends with daughters who, uh, who have um Saturn they have a Saturn connection like Saturn on the sun or something like that and it's it's almost like they've come here to stabilize them but actually uh, somewhere along the way they've taken the, the child's taken more of a parental role they're, they're, they're just a bit more mature than their parent yes so it's quite a, a weird one I've, I've seen that dynamic play out a lot in my own life too I was like for example growing up I you know my mom was a single mom so uh, I was always concerned about money like are we gonna have enough money because I don't trust my mother I see how she operates and I don't think I trust her with handling the family finances and I was like 11 or 12 years old at the time. Wow. But that's kind of the, the kind of a, um, a dynamic that comes easily with Capricorn kids. It's like you said, to worry about the things. Yeah. Uh, the family, the family structure and the family, not just the finances, but just the family unit in general, mm. the health of the family unit. But again, it's not appropriate for the child to take on that level of responsibility. But um, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, my mother's a Leo son and Leo can be a very childlike energy sometimes if it's not developed and there's little self-awareness so that again that to- that from capricorn to leo is that quincunx again isn't it yes. it's that yes. it's that 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 black spot um you know when you're driving that you just can't see out that window and you have to really yes. twist your neck to have a good look so um it's it's funny how these are the signs that really challenge us because it's almost like those are the areas where we are being forced to look at in ourself in order to acknowledge our own personal areas of growth actually Mm -hmm. maybe perhaps maybe perhaps it is that 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 dynamic that quincunx or that in conjunct which just kind of presents that difficulty that we have to consciously acknowledge right that we have to develop yeah uh, acknowledge and develop right yeah that's that that's definitely true so um i was just wondering because obviously capricorn and scorpio are both passive signs Yes. um do you think that this kind of um it, that plays into it a lot with the with all of the passive signs do you think that there's more of a need to obviously to sort of take yourself away and and, and be a bit more introspective as such but do you think that you could almost put a blanket across all passive signs and say that there's a specific way that passive signs need to be and active signs actually are different 
Right. I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of merit in that statement. So the passive signs being kind of the feminine energy sign. Yes. Like the water and the earth signs. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. I think that's a fair point. Um, definitely with the intuition comes more of a passive observing nature, right? The fire, the fire and the water signs are all about action, right? The fire can kind of, fire signs can kind of almost burn themselves out and the air signs are always moving mm. um, and covering a breadth of territory, but not to the depth that the water signs and the earth signs would cover. That's yeah. A fair statement. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, because I saw you on a couple, I saw you on um, Mary English's podcast. And, yes. um, and as I've mentioned to you, I'm, uh, I'm a good friend of Mary's actually um, and uh, I speak to her quite regularly and she's written a whole series of books on mm-hmm. um, you know how to connect with a Capricorn in your life or the Scorpio or the Gemini or the Libra or whatever so she's written a series of books which are really really useful and uh, very yes. accessible to like you know mm-hmm. non-astrologers mm-hmm. Um, and she's kind of come up with a few sort of uh, sort of solution focused ways of um, kind of helping each sign like one of her ones I think that I found really interesting was um, I think it was if you've got a I think because she I think what she does is she's written it so it's it's like if you've got a Gemini child and then it goes through the moon signs and the ascendant so you can address your specific child and one of them was um, you know uh, you know with your Gemini child if if they're having a bad time go on a drive take yes. them on a little journey and things yes, like that exactly um and implement so there are really useful ways to um there are there are solutions this is the thing about astrology you can look at stuff and almost think that you're condemned to the chart that you've got and how do you do this how do you work with this but um coming from a solution focused approach is mm-hmm. so much more useful to people which is obviously what you do yes. you've you've decided right. it's 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 exactly. we need solutions we don't just need to go to an astrologer and hear that your child is this that and the other so that means they're going to be x y and z you know it's like this is how you can work with it so how did you formulate these solutions how have you kind of worked are you are you a have you got a lot of a busy private practice i i don't so because i still have a full-time job uh i don't um i don't uh have a lot of private clients now just once in a while so i'm mostly focused on uh, doing content for my YouTube channel to kind of help get the content out there. It's That's just such parents. a balancing act, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and you got to make time for your family, of course, too, and mm. time for yourself to be healthy and whatnot. And uh, so, right, I'm mainly focused on producing the content and the books. So, because I love to write, as most Gemini's do. Uh, and um, so that's kind of, I definitely have a preference for written expression over oral expression. And mm. as far as your question about how to come up with solutions, a lot of it's based on just trial and error, a lot of observations of my own life, my own relationships and other people and speaking with parents in detail. And, and I'll, I'll, um, I've heard from parents who have tried some of my kind of solutions focused tips and they say, that's it. That's, you know, that's actually, it worked. Like I, I told uh, parents of Gemini children, you know, Gemini children have such an extreme amount of mental energy that they find mundane tasks like eating it's just hard to just sit and eat right so i said you know this may seem very counterintuitive but try letting them watch a little tv while they're eating or giving them a book while they eat right because we're taught oh you shouldn't you know, no books at the table right that's kind yeah of school parenting i will parent that way i'm a pretty liberal parent so try that and see if they will sit and eat and this parent said, oh, that, that worked. I just let them watch TV. She has two Gemini kids and they eat. I said, that's the thing. You, they have to direct the ener- mental energy somewhere. A book, a magazine, taking them on a drive because they're curious about things and they can look out the window. My son does that. He has a Gemini. Yeah. He just kind of sits in daydreams and looks out the window in the car. And he never tells me I'm bored. I think that's because of the Gemini energy. Because we, if I'm bored, I'll daydream. That's kind of one of my favorite things yeah. to do. As a kid, it was one of my favorite things to do. I was never bored and my son has never told me hey i'm bored like do something to entertain me because i think he has this built-in daydreaming entertainment system yeah yeah (laughs) right so those things they may seem counterintuitive to parents but with the gemini energy you it's you have to direct it somewhere or it just all over the place and the kids have such trouble focusing in general that that um directing the activity giving them a book Giving them on a drive, giving them a magazine to leaf through. That's just helpful to get them to focus on something, yeah. especially when they're younger and may not understand this dynamic yet. I think, I think, um, 
uh, I know a few um, children with very strong mercury placements. Mm -hmm. uh, my niece, for example, has a um, mercury and Uranus conjunction um, and she has a Virgo moon as well. And um, she is like, uh, it's just constant, like very almost ADHD, but it's, it's, I don't know if it necessarily is, it's just who she is. She's just interested in everything. It's nonstop. She's always interested in what's on the TV. And then she wants to look at the iPad and, and she loves reading books. You know, she's just so into things and she's very touchy. She's Taurus as well. So it's like looking, touching, sensory. Wow. Um, and a, another friend of mine whose daughter's got a um, Virgo ascendant, um, she likes to line things up and put them in order. And they were like, is she autistic? And, and it's like, well, she's a Virgo rising. So she likes to sort of make sense of things, you know, and put things in, in their place. And she's very tidy and sweeping up and, you know, like very just so Virgo rising. It's so funny to see it happen. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it's really useful to look towards and just even if it's just anybody, you know, but particularly if it's children and you're trying to relate to your child, really looking at sort of the stronger placements in their chart and understanding how that might present itself. Because if you think your child is behaving in a way that's a mystery to you, um, you know, it's, it, it must be there in the chart. It must be there displayed. It can't, you know, their behavior is going to be there. You're going to see it. Exactly. And you'll, and then if you're given the tools to understand that, you'll understand why they are like that, right? Or why they, they exhibit, right? Like my, so my son, even though he, I'm pretty sure he's an introvert, he has a packed 11th house, which mm. is, that's going to be, I think, a hard thing for him to manage as he grows older because he loves to be around friends, but he needs his alone time to recharge or he will just mm. calm down. I, you know, I, um, I'm a very solitary person. I'm kind of a rugged individualist. I like doing things on my own. Um, I have a first house Uranus, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I'm very comfortable with myself. So he would, you know, because he's an only child, um, you know, I would kind of assume he would be okay playing games by himself or reading by himself. And he would tell me, can you play with me? Or one of my friends to play with me. And I, first I said, I said, why do you need other people to play with you? And then I realized I was projecting kind of my own needs onto him. Like, just because I like to be alone and do things on my own doesn't mean that he is like that. Yeah. So the 11th house will tell you that he has a lot of, I think most of the outer planets in his 11th house, and he has Chiron there too. Okay. So he needs to be part of something. He needs to have some contact with other people. So I have to be better at balancing his need for contact with his friends with his need for alone time so i make sure yeah. to do that but like you said it's in the chart it's right there yes he's a scorpio and yes he's you know he's his he keeps a lot of his thoughts to himself he's very private but he does need some contact with the outside world to be part of something to be have contact with his peers so he so i had to balance that but like you said it was right there it was right there in his chart yeah and and it's interesting because the chart really as we grow into our sons, as we develop over our life's journey, the chart describes the challenges which bring out the experiences which define that character as well. So if he has, if he is going to have this challenge between this kind of 11th house sociable community or in that orientated sort of 11th house plus this like very secretive and um, sort of like lone wolf aspect of being a Scorpio, um, it's going to be a lot of experiences that, you know, are going to really crystallize who he is as a person through those 11th house experiences and other as aspects right. of the chart but it does it, we, we're kind of shaped by our chart as we go through life aren't we right we are definitely definitely and sometimes the aspects are harder and they're harder to integrate yeah on the energies but that's where you get the most fulfillment when you integrate the the energies that are sometimes squared right or opposite each yeah other. Uh, absolutely so um, I think um, just before we wrap up um, the first half, I just had one more question for you, which was um, kind of about, you know, looking at a child's chart and the kind of the ethical kind of uh, perspective of that, because there are some people that really think it's not right to look at a child's chart, um, right. you know, or you can look at it. But, you know, if you're if you're a parent of a child, you know, it's very easy to project and anybody can project their stuff onto a child's chart, not just the parent. Yes. Um, so it's like about understanding the infinite potential that you see in the chart rather than the, the very sharp focus potential that is coming from your own personal experience. 
Um, and I just wondered, um, you know, what your kind of what your perspective is like, you know, were you happy looking at your child chart from the moment he was born? Or did you give yourself a break and think I'll get to know him first before I look at the chart? Like, what was your perspective? That's an interesting question. So uh, that's something I talked with Mary about at length, um, kind of being very careful about the predictive aspect of looking at the birth chart you really don't you don't you don't want to look you don't want to focus on predictions and the chart will not tell you exactly what will happen in the child's life or exactly how they will deal with certain situations the way i look at it i think it's fine to look at the child's chart and give some guidance about how they may approach things or how they may communicate or how they may the best possible learning styles what those may be but you always want to respect free will. I mean, you can have people with very similar placements. Somebody with a, a, a second house moon may like to accumulate money. They may like to spend money. It depends kind of on the bent and the rest of the energy in the chart. So have to be very careful about that. So mm. I, when my son was born, I knew he was a Scorpio son, but interestingly, as you pointed out, I did not like look at everything in his chart right away. I just kind of gave myself some time with him. And then later on I looked and it's, it's funny because I Maybe it's because the people closest to you, it's hard for you to remember a lot of his exact placements. Yeah. So I have to kind of re remind myself a lot of the time, oh yeah, he has like this 11th house stellium and he has this 12th house Uranus. So all these things, and that's going to be very, you know, kind of a difficult energy for him to understand and grasp until later. So um, I think it's fine to give guidance based on the child's chart, but we have to be very careful about predicting how the child will be, how they will act, what will happen in their lives. I would mm. not recommend any type of predictive consultation, Yeah, um, but definitely it's definitely helpful to understand just the general energies. I just I, I'm always amazed at the when, when whenever I'm in a group on Facebook or something seeing um, a mum go I've seen my child chart and I'm so worried for them because they've got this going on and I always think that's they don't have to do with that what you think that they yes. will you know yes. I, I it always makes me scratch my head and I kind of think it's <sighs> I, I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong. I, I've got my own issues and I've got like, a, I could be a bit of a hypochondriac at time. And I look at my chart and go, oh, does that mean I'm going to, you know, get arthritis or, you know, something like that. But, um, you know, it's one thing to do it in your own chart, but another to sit there like going, tying yourself in knots over something that could never happen. It's your child. Right. And, and then you're, right. you're treating them in a way that is not completely, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not unbiased you're kind of uh, you know amending your behavior your parenting technique because out of a place of fear almost exactly that I see that what you describe all the time even with parents with very young kids like a year two years old well I read that a Scorpio moon placement always means the, a bad relationship with the mother and I say no. not necessarily it doesn't always mean that no sure it could mean I mean that could happen I, I don't know but it doesn't always mean that so how can I you know have a good relationship with my kid first of all you have to stop focusing on the negative thoughts because if yeah. you follow law of attraction principles which i do you're going to attract into your life what you give your time and attention yeah. to if all your thoughts are negative that's what you're going to attract so you want to think about how you want your life to be and just you know take each day at a time so mm. that's but i see those questions too and and the great thing is that a lot of information is out there the other problem is there's a lot of information out there yeah and there's a lot there are a lot of people that you know, um, a lot of a lot of serious astrologers are very data driven, and like, like I'm a big fan of Robert Hand, Stephen Arroyo, relationship astrologer. They reference a lot of studies. Stephen Arroyo is a psychologist; has integrated these principles into his psychology practice. He does a lot of work relational astrology, where he's taken surveys and he, in his book, which I love on love and relationships and astrology, he uh, goes over the responses to some of the surveys from people with similar placements. Very data driven. That's fantastic because. We have some studies and data we can look at and then you have other people who will tell you oh this i've had people tell me oh this astrologer said that because i have this this will happen i said well, no because that could be a self-fulfilling prophecy you want to be mm. very careful about that's it stuff so that's self fulfilling the prophecy is the, the danger absolutely yeah. so what you're to your point about these mostly mothers who say well i think i'm afraid this will happen well if you're constantly thinking about it maybe it will but not because it was deemed in the chart because now you're attracting it into your life <laughs> exactly so that could that's that's a that's a big and i i take every opportunity i can to refer people to 
um, podcasts like this one, like yours, like like books that that I've read that are are and other astrologers have read that are that are very well regarded, you know, as opposed to just any information on any website. So that's yeah. kind of where the danger comes. That's from. the it's danger with googling things. Not just Googling what's, you know, in, in general, oh, I've got a, a rash here and what does that mean? And oh, it could be this and it's the worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah. And it's the same with astrology. Uh, you know, it's there are good websites out there. I'm not saying that there aren't, but the majority of little pop up websites everywhere, they contain one person's perspective um, on their take of something. And if you happen to pick up on something and you're already coming from that negative place, you're going to hold on to the negativity. And it could stay with you for a very long time. Um, you know, it's uh, somebody with a, um, a, a Mercury Pluto square here. You know, words really do hold a lot of power. Um, and, you know, whether you've got that placement in your chart or not, uh, I mean, I'm very consciously aware of it. But there are lots of people out there that don't realize that, you know, if you fill your head with all sorts of crap, you know, you, it, it's there in the background, it stays. And, and if it comes to something as precious as the relationship that you have with your child and the way that you behave around your child when you're trying to nurture them and help them grow into the best person that they can be, it can be incredibly damaging. Maybe not directly damaging to the child because perhaps they they grow through it and they don't always listen to the parent and they get to a point where they want to challenge their parents' ideas, which is something that I have always done because I'm just that kind of Aquarius stellium. Um, I, I but, encourage that absolutely. <laughs> but with the parent, it can be very difficult for them to live on a daily basis with this kind of fear perspective. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm I'm all for like the law of attraction. I do my best. It's it's a it's a constant work in progress. That kind of attitude, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. The releasing of the negative thoughts. If you've been if you've been conditioned to that, that you are reconditioning yourself, and that takes time. Yeah, yeah, right? hugely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So um, I think it's a good place to um, okay. kind of take a break um before we do go on our break did you have any um, social media channels or a website you wanted to direct people to absolutely um my website is uh lawschoolheretic.com that's got about my parenting uh con content on there uh and some information about I write some fiction novels too because i i just enjoy that that's how i i uh fulfill my need for creative stuff and then my a YouTube channel, if you Google my name um, or in YouTube, search for it in YouTube, Maria Rieger, it's Positive Parenting with Astrology. And I put on a weekly, I publish weekly parenting content on my YouTube channel on all the signs, relation, relational aspects, parent and child, how to connect with different children, some positive parenting techniques. So you can find me there. And my books are on Your Gemini Child and your Scorpio child are on uh, Amazon, Audible, Kobo, and Barnes and & Noble. Awesome. And if you go to my website or my YouTube channel, and um, there is a link to get the first couple of chapters of each book for free, if anyone's interested in kind of just, um, you know, looking at that. So. Great, that's awesome. And in uh, the second part, we're going to go a little bit more into the elements for um, the zodiac signs and the parenting styles. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. Cool. Thanks a lot.